What's up, everybody? <laughs> it's Back to She Said Live, and we have nothing to talk about today. So we're really going to need your comments and questions in to drive the conversation. I'm just kidding. We have too much to cover <laughs> today. And I thought, Maggie, that this episode would be all about the draft. We would just cover all of the draft this uh, since this happened this past weekend. Um, but there's other things that we're going to have to get to. So let's decide. What do we want to start with first? The exciting forward thinking or the thing that's making us want to cry? <laughs> well, when you put it like that, I mean, <laughs> let's let's get the, the bad stuff out of the way first. Get the bad stuff out of the way first. Yeah, okay. let's do it. We got to talk about Aaron Rodgers. Um, I think that's pretty much what what's on everybody's mind, even though it was draft weekend this weekend. We should have been focused, excited, amped up. And I think my biggest qualm was that it was dropped this weekend because it really took away from the draft and especially for the players that the Packers just drafted really outshine their moment. But everyone around the league and especially Packers fans could not stop talking about everything that's come out with Aaron Rodgers. And there's a lot of it. There's a lot of speculation and I honestly think very few hard facts um, but we're going to kind of parse through it and figure out how we're feeling and what we're thinking. So, I mean, where's your head at? I go back and forth, right? So when it came out on Thursday, I was like, this is it. We're done. Time to like mentally prepare for this because you and I talk about this a lot. And we've talked about this on Pax What She Said. We've talked about this on other platforms where, you know, we were younger during the transition from Favre. Yes. So that just happens, you know, it, I know I was in high school, like early high school, you probably were as well, or were you in middle school? Please don't tell me you were in middle school. I was in late, <laughs> late middle school. Right. So it's, it's harder to kind of get your head around what's going on when you're a younger fan. So this, you know, this is the person that we grew up with watching, playing for the team. So I think it's difficult, even though we, we saw it happen, you kind of think once it happens, it, it might not happen again, or you would hope that the organization won't let it happen again. Learn from their past mistakes, yeah. Right. So I, I try to be as objective as possible when things happen like this, because we know that there's not necessarily a right and a wrong. And then, you know, there's always going to be some gray area in between as far as what's happening. You know, the Packers could have given him a heads up on some things. He, if this was a leak from his camp, you know, maybe this wasn't the best time for that to happen. If he really wanted out, I feel like it would have made more sense to do this in March when the free agency window started. So, right. you know, I, I think at the end of the day, I feel better about him playing another year with the Packers than I did kind of going into the weekend, but I don't know how much better I feel, if that makes sense. No, it does. I think it dropped on Thursday and it was like a bomb went off in our little Packer world and the NFL world. And since then, a lot of different things have come out from a lot of different sources um, about the situation. And I think like I, the only thing that we know for a fact is Rogers is unhappy in some capacity, whether it's with front office decision-making contract extensions, communication, probably all the above. And the Packers front office has definitely done things to anger him. I think you put it perfectly. There's blame on both sides. Like there's no finger pointing here. It's, it's both. And there's reports that he doesn't want to come back. But then at the Derby, he said how much he loves Green Bay and loves the fans and is disappointed that this leaked. Okay, take take that <laughs> take it that way you will. And Brian Gutenkunst and Matt LaFleur and the entire Packers front office has been pretty steadfast, not just this past weekend, but the last couple of months that Aaron Rodgers is their guy, Aaron Rodgers is the leader of this team, and Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback that they want. That message hasn't changed um, as it shouldn't, um, and they're pressing it a lot harder. So that's really all we know, right? All the conversations that have happened internally, and I think Andrew Brandt really hit the nail on the head here, is there's a lot of conversations that we are not privy to. And all three of those guys, Mark Murphy included, have gone out to talk to Rogers and figure this out. We don't know any of what those conversations were about. All we know is that there is unhappiness and the Packers want Rogers to stay. I don't know what to make of it anymore, um, I think it, to, in my head, it feels like it's at a place where 
there may not be reconciliation because I go through all of the possible scenarios here and not a lot of them feel like it's going to make Good. Rogers happy. Right. And, and again, like there's a report that came out that he wants Brian Gutenkunz fired. I don't think that Aaron, you know, AJ Hawk debunked that too. It's just a lot of, he said, she said, and I've taken the approach a little bit this weekend where I'm trying not to pay attention until there's like an actual concrete action for me to judge upon. The hearsay is just, there's too much going on. Um, but I also don't know like where the middle ground is here. For the Andy time. Herman, thank you for joining us uh, on Twitter. Absolutely. The Packers should have just kept Tim Boyle. I think that would have addressed a lot of the concerns that we're having. Right. <laughs> and but we're no. going to probably get to actually Tim Boyle in a bit in a more serious way because Maggie wrote a phenomenal article today for Cheesehead TV that kind of addresses quarterback depth. So we'll get there, Andy. Don't worry. <laughs> But I mean, I agree with you. I'm I'm in that same mold where you can only do so much. And it, I know it's really hard. Somebody in the comments had said, is this an Aaron Rodgers free zone? I understand that. Yes. But, you know, we we don't want it to take up the the space that it's taking up. And, you know, like you talked about, Perry, with it being draft weekend, you know, it feels like there was a lot less about the way that the Packers improved their team and everything was like this dark cloud. So, for my own mental sanity and for yours and for a lot of people's, I know it is something that we do kind of have to talk about and weigh possible scenarios. But, you know, as far as we know right now, nothing will happen until at least June 1st. Right. So give yourself a month to like decompress and not think about this because we don't think anything can actually happen. So my mom always used to say when I was little, don't worry about nothing until it becomes something. So right now this yeah. is nothing. We don't have anything concrete. Maybe in June, maybe in June, it'll be something, but worrying about it now just kind of taints the perception that a lot of us have of what's going on. And football is supposed to be something that's a distraction and is fun and is something that we enjoy. So let's, let's pivot, Perry. Let's pivot okay. a little bit. Well, let's pivot because I brought it up already and I really want to talk about it, which is, and yeah, we will probably have to talk about the scenarios in which Aaron Rodgers is or is not on the roster, but you wrote an awesome article today. And I think it warrants a discussion because it was really good analysis and really smart. And it's actually less about who's QB one and who is on the depth chart, because right now the only quarterbacks on the roster technically are Aaron Rodgers and Jordan love. And a lot of times the Packers, actually not a lot of times, always the Packers go into camp at least with a QB three or even a QB four, certainly one that's on the practice squad. And they don't have that because like Andy astutely pointed out, uh, <laughs> they, they, they didn't resign Tim Boyle. So I want you to give you, I want to give you space first to talk about the article, your thought process um, and kind of explain your thinking. And then we can kind of dive into the different scenarios that the Packers could go down. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's, it's, difficult when you are a fan to think about things objectively but that's why whenever I write anything I try to approach it as objectively as possible and I kind of ignore how I maybe am feeling personally and I, I try to rationalize things as much as possible that's why I haven't said much on social media about how I'm feeling because I don't really know like from a fan perspective I don't really know how to feel or how I should be feeling about what's happening with my favorite football team so what we do know as that Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love are the only two quarterbacks on the roster. It is at this point hard for me to foresee going into the 2021 season with both Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love on the roster and it being, you know, a good situation. I think it's really hard to picture them getting along. Even if it's not them specifically, there's a lot of extracurricular factors that make it difficult to see them working well together at this point. And that's not necessarily fair to either of them. It's just how that could end up. So the article that I wrote for Cheesehead TV was about the Packers needing a quarterback three, potentially quarterback two, if something were to happen, whether Aaron Rodgers is traded after June 1st or if Jordan Love gets traded. Um, and it needs to be a veteran. I don't think that there is a scenario where you can go into the season with Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love, and an undrafted rookie as quarterback three. Maybe you can. But to me, at this stage in Aaron Rodgers' career, he's focusing on himself and getting a ring. And I understand that. And yes. it's not necessarily his job to come in and coach up somebody who's trying to take his job. Right. Like it, that's just not how it works. Right. And I'm sure he did everything that he could emotionally or no, 
literally uh, for Jordan Love. But like you said, he's focused on game plan, keep his body right, go out and win games. Right. So then if you look at maybe Aaron Rodgers does leave, there is no way that the Packers front office can feel comfortable going into the season with Jordan Love and an undrafted free agent as his backup. And, you know, we don't know. That's one of the things that I tried to hammer home in this article is we don't know how the Packers front office feels about Jordan Love. We can make assumptions and those assumptions are that they don't think he's ready. So maybe this veteran would come in and start. Maybe they wouldn't back up Jordan Love because maybe he's just not ready to take over the reins. And maybe that's why the Packers are pushing so hard to keep Aaron Rodgers in the long term because he's not the pros. He hasn't developed enough into the prospect that they thought that he could be. Right. But, and and I think he was developed he was drafted with the understanding that he was a developmental quarterback and that right. he needed at least probably two years to get to a place where the Packers felt like he could start under center. Right. And I think that's where these conversations come in, where you understand why Aaron Rodgers would feel slighted when the Packers make a selection and you know the narrative is, oh my gosh, they drafted somebody who's trying to take my job. And in all reality, it's we have to plan for four years down the road because he needs four years to develop. Like it is a project. And I right. think that if there was a conversation about that, you know, before the selection, we wouldn't be seeing a lot of this animosity. So the the boiling point of the article is that whether it's Aaron Rodgers in a backup or Jordan Love in a backup, that backup should be mm-hmm. a veteran quarterback. So one of the examples I gave was Drew Stanton uh, with the Browns. He came in and backed up Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield got the keys to the franchise right away as a rookie, the number one draft pick in the 2018 draft. I understand that these are different scenarios. This would be a veteran potentially coming in to support Jordan Love and mentor Jordan Love while Aaron Rodgers does Aaron Rodgers things and potentially takes his team to the Super Bowl. It's just really hard if you look at the quarterback room right now to think of a dynamic where there's Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love, and it is, you know, everything's great. Everything's smooth sailing. So I think if you have somebody like Josh McCown or who's not, I mean, he's not going to be the guy. I believe he's retired or should be retired. But a guy like Josh McCown. Even, you know, some of the comments talking about Tim Boyle, I think you need a mediator. Tim Boyle was the perfect example of that because he was close with Aaron Rodgers and he also was... I think significant in Jordan Love's development. He took a lot of pressure off Jordan Love in his rookie season without a traditional training camp. You know, everybody jokes about Brett Hundley, but you a player like that, yeah. Scott Tolzien. There's a lot of guys who had worked with Aaron Rodgers. I'm not saying Scott Tolzien specifically now, but there's a lot of guys who have, who had spent a couple of years with Aaron Rodgers and become close enough to him that I think you just need somebody with a little bit of experience to kind of that has played in NFL games that can help Jordan Love kind of navigate this process. Because mm. one of the things that I, I maybe is not being talked about enough is just what this means for him if Aaron leaves and he's handed the keys to the most historic franchise in the NFL when he doesn't feel supported and ready for that. Right. Especially with an organization saying repeatedly that Aaron's their guy. If they trade Aaron after saying Aaron's our guy, here, Jordan Love, here you go. That, that's a shitty yeah. spot to be in. That's tough. Yeah. I feel for him in this situation in a lot of different ways. And I think Matt LaFleur summed it up perfectly, which is just, he told Jordan, focus on you, do yep. you focus on your development, block out the noise. Like that, like, and it is about him, but I think at the end of the day, you also know it isn't about him personally. It's not right. about Jordan loves as a person. It's the idea of the pick without consultation. It could have been any quarterback. It's not Jordan love. So, mm. I think him being developmental also plays a role in this where if he, and I don't remember 2008 super vividly, like we touched on at the beginning of this show, but I think that at least from what it sounds like in hindsight, maybe blurring this a little bit, but apparently at the time, at least Rogers had had reps in live preseason and the Cowboys game where you could get a some glimpse into, okay, this guy's actually the real deal. We have had none of that with Jordan Love. And right. I think it's fair to say in in defense of the front office, nobody could have predicted that. Nobody knew that this would go on this long or what was going to happen, right? Like we were in the pandemic when he was picked, but you can't plan around the pandemic for this purpose. So no preseason, no mini camp, no time for him. We might know more, but I think the your article hits on a really good point, which is that Rogers is 
not just leader, NFL MVP, all of that stuff, but he's been in the league for 16 years and you get some level of like institutional knowledge in that, that whether he tries to or not pass it down to Jordan Love, it gets passed down like through osmosis, like through <laughs> observation, right? Right. And, and without that, and you're spot on, if it's just Jordan Love and an undrafted free agent this year, there is so much about the league and being a professional and taking care of yourself and training and footwork and all those things that Jordan Love probably won't get that he should get from a vet. And I think that it's also just like smart operations to if Jordan Love isn't ready this guy has at least been in the league long enough that he can learn a playbook and know what to expect in a live game, like at bare minimum. Um, so I completely agree. I thought it was just like a really interesting thought that I don't know if anyone else is thinking about because obviously there's so much to think about in this situation, but I think it would really behoove the Packers to make that move. Um, maybe not yet, maybe figure out what's going on with QB one first, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's a it's a great idea. They should do well, it. I appreciate that. And yeah. I think, you know, before we wrap this up, because nobody wants to keep talking about Aaron Rodgers, I think, you know, the comments, there's people making really good points. Somebody said, like, you know, everything happens so quickly. And we know that these incidents don't necessarily happen in a vacuum. There's all these little Jenga pieces that are falling and everything kind of builds up into an eventually, you know, a boiling point. And one of the the comments said, you know, maybe the Packers just didn't have time to let Aaron Rodgers know. But I think those are the pieces that are missing, right? Is, you know, you don't necessarily know you're going to take Jordan Love or trade up for him at 26, but you have to at least have an idea that you like a player enough to trade up for them. Right. Here's my, here's my thought with that because, and this is just me speculating. The Packers have a, a big board. They have grades on players that they like in the first round. And Brian Gutenkunz has said in a press conference, Jordan Love, they had a, clearly a round one grade on him and he was left and they went up and took him. If he is on your big board to potentially take in the first round, even if you don't, even if you end up taking Justin Jefferson, you say, Hey Raj, just let you know, we kind of love this guy. If he's there, we might take him. We might not. doesn't mean anything to you. We just want you to know. Because yep. you know that any quarterback selection by the Green Bay Packers, honestly, at any round, second round, third round, the media is going to freak out. Everyone's going to freak out. It yeah. just doesn't – it's not – like, it's just common sense. So I don't – not enough time. They trade up, blah, blah. It, that conversation should have been had before draft day. Yes. But, you know, the comments now are excited. Oh, God, here comes the dog. There's a lot of comments talking about how excited this draft class was. And I think that's yeah, – let's, let's, let's shift yeah. to the draft. I, I don't want to talk about Rodgers, really, because, like we said at the beginning, this is just, like, this is – there's so much swirl, and we could be totally wrong. We could be having this conversation with missing facts. So what really happened this weekend, what we actually want to talk about in this show, is the draft, because the 2021 draft – happened and the Packers took how many players? 10? Nine. Nine. Thank you. Probably know that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, the people know Bo's name. That's cute. That's adorable. And yeah, the Packers drafted. They made some very um, interesting selections. I want to get Maggie's initial reactions about it. If you don't already, she she podcasted the Pack a Day podcast crew, as do I. But it was Maggie who podcasted right after Thursday night, right after they took Eric Stoke. So if you want, you know, full, how long was it? 45 minute breakdown with her and Andrew and Kyle. You can go listen to that. But Maggie, how we knew, I mean, we mocked Stokes to the Packers. Not that that And happened. we got mocked for it. Just we did get, <laughs> we literally got so much heat for it. To me, it is the most obvious, like now that it's happened, it's him and there's another player that I think were just so obvious, but it's the most obvious Packers pick like ever. Like, of course, of course they drafted Eric Stokes. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that you and I talked about a little bit on the pre-draft show was some of the tendencies that we were maybe looking at and potentially what that would look like if the Packers kind of shied away from focusing solely on RAS. So they did that in some of the later rounds relative athletic score. I'm sure everybody in the comments knows what that is, but right. And Eric Stokes is like the pinnacle of 
a freaky athlete with a high RAS who it's, it's been fun to kind of see as his tape comes out that it's harder and harder to watch him because they just don't, they just don't throw the ball his way. And that's exciting. And I mean, I think if you talk about a player that can come in and make an immediate impact in Joe Barry's defense opposite Jair, whether they want to give him a shot at nickel, even though I think the Packers took another really good nickel corner on day three, it's just, it wasn't maybe the sexiest draft that the Packers could have had. It's not on anybody's list, even though I think grades are stupid as being like a home run, but it was the serviceable draft that if you talk about grab a couple players that can potentially put green Bay, you have a better corner. You have a starting center unless they play him at guard and move Elton or something. And then you have another wide receiver who can play just about anywhere for you. Immediately. So, yeah. There you I, go. I, the first two days to me were, were a home run. And I think that you can make your assumptions, but a lot of the national media conversation around the Packers draft is so clouded by Rogers, right? If Rogers was undeniably on our center, I think we would be viewing this draft very differently than we are at the moment, but I love it. I love Stokes. I think I was a little bit higher. You and I both were a little bit higher on him than like the average person, but he brings a lot to the table. There's a lot about him. I think that needs to be developed. That's fine. Or he's a rookie. That makes sense. Um, he's a really nice compliment to Jair, like size, speed, athleticism. I think you and I were kind of gushing about, you know, that he can blitz. Like he's fun. He's got a lot of traits to him that I think are different than what the Packers have on the roster now, namely speed and explosiveness. Yes. And he will immediately compete, immediately compete with, with Kevin King. Um, I agree with you that I think, uh, Josh Myers will also potentially start. And that's really exciting because the offensive line depth was pretty abysmal going <laughs> into this draft. And they took a bunch of developmental guys on day three, which is wonderful. You should always, we should always have as much offensive line depth as possible. And then you get Amari Rogers, right? It's a gadget player. It's the slot guy. It's the quote, Randall Cobb. Everyone's making that comparison um, that the Packers haven't had. And that's really exciting. That is a weapon who I genuinely believe will start week one and add to this offense. So I don't know if Rogers is on our center. Oh, thanks, Mad Mark. That's very nice of you. No question. You don't want us to answer anything? <laughs> we appreciate you. So. Send it in. We'll answer. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, if you want us to answer questions, send you know send them in. Um, we're happy to do that. That's what we're here for. But we're just going to keep talking until you do. This is what we do anyway. This so we you know, do anyway. we'll do exactly. this for two hours when the show ends. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Amari Rogers is exciting. I mean, we're going to take the best offense in the league and arguably make it better with adding a real slot guy. Like the Packers have done a good job, I think, of adding in Tyler Irvin and maybe Tavon Austin. And but this is going to be a solid, solid guy. It's going to come in and do all of that wrapped into one. Not to mention kick and punt return, which we all know the Packers need help on special teams. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts when you look at developmental players, you know, talking about, see, Mad Mark said he's going to buy us each a half beer, which is Perfect. fantastic. Okay. You know, those New York prices, <laughs> Perry's got to come to Wisconsin and she can have like five beers for that price. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like if Eric Stokes is a developmental guy, for the Packers, or maybe, you know, I know that his agility was kind of a knock. There were some of those things. Jerry Gray is the perfect secondary coach to learn under. Just like we talk about offensive line, you know, depth and development. Adam Stenovich is one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL. And, you know, he's, the Packers are lucky to have him. I don't think they want to speak too highly of him at the risk that he'll go elsewhere and get yeah. a more lucrative gig. So, you know, there's just a lot of really good position coaches that Green Bay has that can take some of these guys who have that combination of, you know, just football IQ and smarts and talent with athleticism and combine them into some of the players that we've seen. And obviously I know Adam Senevich wasn't necessarily there when David Bakhtiari got drafted, but that's the kind of stuff you're talking about. You're taking these mid round guys and polishing them to the point where they can go on and be long-term starters for your franchise. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, uh, I don't think Stokes is as developmental as one would think. I don't he think he's Jair Alexander going to start week one, but I definitely, you know, in this world can see Eric Stokes starting in the 2021 season. Can you leave me alone? Can you just. <laughs> can you do that? 
it was an accident because I posted it at like, you know, like midnight. Mm, but then I fixed it. Maggie. That's late for Maggie. Then yeah. I fixed it. I go to bed at like nine, guys. I have a puppy and he goes to bed and then I go to bed. So. Yeah. Um, Sto- Someone asked if Stoke returned kicks. He did not. He's so fast that like maybe if he did, that would also be a really fun option on special teams. But Stokes is not really a special teamer. I don't think he's going to be and I wouldn't expect him to be. But Amari Rogers for sure will be. And I was just so excited about that one. I I I can't tell if it's the player or just the fact that the national media just shut up for like one second <laughs> about the Packers weapon. Just a second. Just a second. Just a quick sec. <laughs> Come on. But I think I'm really excited. He just feels again like a very obvious Packers pick. He's just so obvious. Like, how did we not see that coming? Of course, they love him. Of course, Matt Lafleur knows exactly what he wants to do with him. And I'm really excited to see him play. I love players' backstories. I love the draft mostly because it's just like you're watching all these guys' dreams come true. Like that is so beautiful. They've worked their whole lives to make it to the draft and get drafted by a team, and then it happens. And then you see that. He wanted to go to the Packers. That was his choice. That was his, you know, number one choice. And he didn't want to get his yeah. hopes up. And then it happens. Like, that's amazing. And also, obviously, he wants to come to the Packers. Yeah, and I mean, like, some of that, like, with, with my love that he is the Ohio State Center, number 71, was also drafted just like Corey as number 71, you know, seven years later. Like, there's just all these fun little in this draft class. And um, I know some of the comments were talking about Slayton and that's, I think part of it, right. Is like the, the Packers hit the first picks and now I on a lot of developmental guys. Slayton. Okay. I don't, you know, he's not really Clark, but he's going to be in, in the rotation. I think coming right. In, 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 they progress Slayton being an example of that. Does it make somebody like Dean Lowry a little bit more expendable post June? so I think that that's kind of what the Packers did. There's a lot of players, maybe even guys that were drafted last year, like Jake Hansen, that All right, I think we lost Maggie, but she's making some great points. And <laughs> um, I guess we can talk about day three a little bit until Maggie comes back. I don't know a lot of these. I don't know a lot of these guys, but it's fine. I think when anytime you draft offensive linemen, it's a good move, right? Oh, you're back. Hello. Um, I never left. I was right here the whole time. You were a little frozen. <laughs> I'm going to blame um, Bojack. All right. What's the first Broadway show you're going to when theaters open up? Oh, wow. We're changing directions. Um, I'm too old for this. I don't even know what's going to be on Broadway, but I would love to see Lion King again. That was amazing. Is that a good answer? I don't know. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Love the New York questions. Um, I see a lot of people asking about defensive line, and I don't know if you were chatting about defensive line before you froze, but... I think Slayton is really interesting. I saw his size and weight, and I re- I thought of your boy, BJ Raji. Yeah, and get in the Gravedigger's number. You know, I think sometimes the Packers just know, right, when they give out a number, like Eric Stokes getting 21. It's promising. I can't tell in the comments if I'm still frozen. Or, Perry, you're making faces. Your connection is not wonderful. I will say that. All right. You're back now. You're back now. Um. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry that I, I brought up BJ Rajib, but which way? I gotta go this way. Yeah, there you yeah. go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that a lot of times the Packers, the Packers are they have their draft and develop philosophy. They don't always draft for need. They don't always take a player that fans think that they need. But I just I view this draft as hitting all of the needs adding to depth where potentially there was already depth that there needed to be like defensive line, like the offensive line, another corner, another wide receiver, a running back in later rounds. Like they hit everything that I would have wanted them to hit. They even took a linebacker. So this draft, 
address needs, but also plan for the future in like the most perfectly synergistic Packer way. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. And I mean, if we talk about like last year's draft class being entirely for the future, I think this draft class primarily is for now. So it was like a complete 180 compared to what we saw last season, right? Like this was the epitome of this is a team who's getting a couple pieces because they feel like they're a couple pieces away. Yeah, a hundred percent. So there's a question here, um, Nagler Jones R2. For both of you, who do you think is gonna be the best pick from this draft? I don't like those kinds of projections. I'm not a scout. So I don't know how this each of these players are going to transition to the NFL, but in terms of impact, I think the most immediately felt impact is going to be either from Stokes or Amari Rogers. See, I was going to, I, I, I agree with you on Amari Rogers, but I'm going to say Myers. Cause I feel like he realistically has the best chance to come in and play the most snaps for okay. the Packers. And if he ends up like Elton Jenkins, he could be the future at center or one of the guard spots for like 10 years for the Packers, at least until he gets a second contract. So as far as snaps as a rookie, it's Myers for me. I don't disagree. I definitely don't disagree. Um, I think that it puts the Packers also in a better position depending on where David Bakhtiari is in his rehab. Just a lot of flexibility there. And I think you touched on it before, um, but, you know, Ohio State guy mentor was Corey Lindsley. If he's anything like Corey Lindsley, like, we're set. We're set. Um, I see someone else brought up outside linebacker, which is something that I think I tweeted about this week as well, which is just like that I was a little bit surprised that the Packers didn't take an edge in this. Um, just like a rusher in this draft. I think there was a couple of things um, that factored into that, right? They have a couple of guys on the roster from last season that we didn't really see much of, right? Uh, Garvin or what, what's the other one? Prevalon. There's a there's a Randy Ramsey. There's a few that, that could develop further. They must really like where Rashawn Gary's at. Maybe they're going to extend Zadarius. Um, but so. also I think that this was just not the best draft for edge rushers at the end of the day. Yeah, and I mean, I think there were a couple guys kind of going into the second round, but when you hear Gutekunst, or when like when he had his post-presser day, it made sense hearing him say, what's he going to do? Rodgers in the second Myers in that spot, and then we're fortunate enough to be able to trade up and get Amari Rodgers at pick 85. So, you know, I think that that's a big part of it too, is maybe there were some guys that they really liked at edge in those spots. It was just a matter of maybe more immediate needs and the needs won the tiebreaker. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. That's always how it goes. Right. I mean, Packers wanted a wide receiver in 2020. They sure did. <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> um, so, all right, guys, let's, let's keep sending in some questions here. I, Someone brought up something that I wanted to talk about. Time to move on from his measurables that they still use. Yeah, okay. So this this comment, I think, is pretty fairly insightful, which is just that the Packers have very like specific measurables that they look for. And I think this draft actually turned it on it, turned it on its head a little bit. And they drafted a couple guys that aren't necessarily in the thresholds in which they used to. What do you think of that? Is that Goot straying? Is that just the league is changing? They like what was on tape more? Combo? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely, you know, they were asked about this a little bit kind of in the post-draft pressers, and it was a lot of, like, it's harder to assess these guys when you can't always watch them in person. There wasn't a combine. So I think sometimes maybe, like, specifically in the COVID year, you kind of have to throw measurables out the window and as high as it would be, uh, but the Packers, I think, got just like because that's what showed up on like the freak athleticism. Am I am I just fucked? Or am I just gonna see the whole time because I'm frozen? Or like <laughs> yeah, you're going in, you're going in and out a little bit, a, a little bit. Yeah, um, it's okay. We're we're getting some good. We're getting some good. I don't know. Mark, are you on like uh what what's that video game you guys like? No, he's just sitting. Oh. I was just gonna make fun of Mark and it backfired on me. He's watching the dog. Okay. Um <laughs> looking for some love. Are you on that video game? 
I don't know. I'm just trying to make fun of Mark. Make light of the situation. Uh, what's the best game to watch that demonstrates his talent and upside? No correlation to the Rogers drama. That, my friend, is a question for Andy Herman or Zach Cruz or not me. Not definitely not me. It is a really good question, though. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, I don't have like in my head his best tape. I, I mean, I'm glad that you pointed out 2018 instead of 2019. That's yeah, you know, it's a good move. Apparently, but... he had a bunch. Um, I would look for someone who knows that information more than I do. I know my wheelhouse, you know, like grinding tape, not that. Not at least not college tape. We can grind the pro tape. Pro tape. Yeah. I rewatch the games before we record packs, which she said. Hell yeah. All right, Maggie, a lot happened this weekend and somehow we just spitballed for like 36 minutes and... Did we miss anything? I mean, the Packers have 88 slots filled on their 90 man. So Goody talked a little bit about potentially bringing an inside linebacker, you know, a quarterback at some point, whether it's an undrafted guy, somebody will come in and be a third quarterback for the time being for training camp. So let's see what who the last two picks are. But I think I think two veterans makes the most sense over undrafted. I agree. And I think that's just like smart. It's just smart. Bring in some bets. Do you, okay, here's a question. Here's a question. Do the Packers bring in non-quarterback? Quarterback's not part of this conversation. Do the Packers bring in any more free agents now that the draft is done? Are there any like holes that they need to plug with a free agent? If, if they do, I think it's defensive line or like a KJ Wright. Because I know that they were high on some inside linebackers, potentially Jeremiah Uzukoromoa, who went to the Browns right before the Packers picked. But Browns yeah. did a great draft. Sorry. They absolutely did. I they had my favorite draft, and I'm not just saying that as a biased observer. I really think that they did. But their top two picks were guys I wanted so badly for the Packers. You like Schwartz too, right? He he went to them in round three, Anthony Schwartz. Anthony Schwartz? Oh my god, the Browns had a great draft. <laughs> <laughs> Browns is a role. Um, Ooh, we hope. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know if there's any vets. I think my um, Richard Sherman dreams died with the Eric Stokes pick. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and uh, we saw that um, Desmond King got picked up by the Raiders today. I guess Casey Hayward is still floating out there, but I don't think the Packers really need like that much. Secondary. He's going to the Raiders. Casey Hayward. Both of them. Yeah, Casey Hayward Wait. just went to the Raiders Wait. for. That's who I meant. That's who I meant. Who else did you say? Does be king. Oh, my bad. Whatever. They're all jumbled in my head. Um, yeah, I don't. I think that the Packers roster feels very solid after this draft, especially with guys that I think will contribute early, which is not to bring back to Aaron Rodgers, but why it's kind of frustrating because the Packers could win a Super Bowl this year. And we're talking about either being Super Bowl contenders or being in a rebuild year. Like those are the extremes that we're at right now. You really just had to bring the whole vibe down, Perry. You just no. Well, <laughs> mm, sorry. well, okay. Here's the thing: is that like if I operate under the assumption that we have another year with Rodgers, then I don't want to get my heart broken. All right, Tyler. Tyler Herrick wants us to talk about Bailey Gaither. What is there to say? He's the new Jeff Janis, right? Isn't that what everybody's saying? No, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> the last time the Packers brought in a wide receiver from San Jose State, it worked out great. Wasn't so James maybe, Jones? yeah, maybe Bailey Gaither is the next James Jones. You know what, Tyler? That's where we're at right now. We'll be optimistic that he's the next James Jones. And Andy can return, I think. Like, I think he's a good special team, or at least a gunner, which obviously was Jeff Janis's bread and butter. So so he's a combo of Jeff Janis and James Jones. Sure. Yep. Great. Yep. That's awesome. I mean, <laughs> both of them did great things. Jeff Janis had a Hail Mary catch in, in the playoffs, which, speaking of, you want to talk about depleted weapons rosters. That game. <laughs> Do we have to talk about? I don't want to talk about it. I don't know. I'm trying to joke around, you guys. Okay, it does not have to be doom <laughs> and gloom over here. Um, 
LaFleur's offense is quarterback friendly. It is. And you know what? Credit to LaFleur through all this. And I are, I know going into the season that no matter what, he's going to do a great job calling plays. Yeah. And I'm really excited to see what happens with Joe Barry's defense. Me as well. Me as well. So does Darnell – okay, we're going to wrap up soon. But last question about the defense. Now with this new fun tool with Eric Stokes, do you think he – Get, gets put in that nickel spot does he is he only an outside guy or does joe barry move darnell savage i don't think that darnell savage is gonna move i'd be curious to see how much dime mike or i almost said mike Patton. joe barry wants to play as opposed to what we saw from mike Patton. obviously it was a lot um but i think and you know the comments are yelling at us for not talking about him shamar gene charles was a, a draft steal he was somebody that a lot of analysts really loved who wasn't necessarily a big name for anybody else. Right. He played for Appalachian state. So I think he has the potential to win the starting kind of star role over like Jaden Sullivan. I don't really know what that means for Kevin King. I think Kevin King and Eric Stokes is going to be a fascinating competition for the other boundary. And maybe you throw Eric Stokes in the nickel star kind of role. If Kevin King wins out, on the boundary initially, but yeah, I think Shamar Jean Charles is going to be really fun as like another chess piece. And I think keep Darnell where he is. Why, why mess with a good thing? Darnell Savage and like best. NFL. I agree with you hundred percent on Darnell Savage. Um, good to have the versatility, right? Good to have the versatility, but don't mess with something that's was working well. Um, I'm really excited to see all this play out in camp. It's going to be really fun to watch this duel in camp and see all the new guys um, and see who ends up starting week one uh, opposite Jair Alexander. That'll be a really interesting, very interesting setup. Words. <laughs> Words are tough, man. <laughs> all right, let's wrap up draft thoughts. Not going to touch Aaron Rodgers again. I'm sorry I keep bringing it up. Wrap up on draft. How do you feel? Do you want to give it a grade? Are we giving grades? We talked about this pre-show. Yeah, my grade, we differed on this. My grade would be a B plus. It's not like the best paper that you've ever written in your life, but it will get you a highly successful passing grade. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it checked all the boxes of everything that the Packers needed. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they could have gotten a couple like weapons or brought in an edge rusher or something a little... They a little more fun. Ryan Hill in round seven, and a lot of people had him going early. He should have gone higher, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I give it a B minus, like C plus B minus. Very similar reasons to you, right? Like, didn't blow me away, but it was satisfying. It was above average. It's passing. Um, I think that the Stokes and Amari Rogers picks Josh Myers to an extent, but kind of will carry this. The, the day three guys, we'll see. Um, but the first three, if you can get like meaningful snaps out of them all in year one, that's a winning, that's a winner for me. Yeah. Any other Agreed. thoughts before we wrap this up? I'm just really upset that my internet was bad during the fun part of this. And it was great for the Aaron Rodgers part. Girl, it's fine. We still got it. We got your thoughts. We heard you. You know, I vamped for a little bit, but we were good. No one wants me to vamp. That's okay. Everyone's here for you. And that is not true. Real analysis. That is absolutely um, not and true. And not me like fluffing it up. So, oh, we just want to say again. thank you to everyone. <laughs> we <laughs> Tyler say Giffen. Thank you to everyone for joining us again today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, Maggie and I have a lot, lot coming up. We're really excited. We've got a fun guest tonight, potentially another one this month. Um, we'll be up at camp in in August. Uh, we have that booked, actually. So that's set in stone. And um, we're both with the Packaday podcast crew. Maggie writes two articles a week for Cheesehead TV that you should be reading. Sorry, just one article a week for Cheesehead TV. I just want more Maggie content, basically, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> um, she doesn't need more work. I just want more content. This is about me. Oh, here's Bojack. Um, Bojack. And we... We appreciate all of the love from you all and the comments. Next month, bring more questions. Um, we want to answer your questions. We don't want to just blab on about things that you don't want to hear about. So bring the <laughs> questions. Um, am I wrapping this up well enough for Nagler? I don't know. Um, I hope Probably I not. 
I hope I become a meme after this. That's a lie. Please don't do that to me, Tyler. Um, and yeah, we will, we'll be back next month. Um, who knows what we'll be talking about. It will be like really heavy into the off season, but listen to the podcast every week. We'll put out a podcast with Pax, which she said this week's is going to be really fun. And um, as always, no matter what, no matter what, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.